The second part of our lecture this morning is on the laws that govern the mind. And I read a, I read a paragraph in an old book, it was probably about 12 years ago now, and it was said so beautifully that I memorised it. And the last sentence in this paragraph set me on a journey of discovery and the result of which I'm going to share with you today. Allow me to recite the paragraph. The same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide alike star and atom control human life. The laws that regulate the, the flow of life through the body are the laws of the mighty intelligent that has jurisdiction of the soul. From him all life begins. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. Majestic words. Notice that last sentence. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. Physical law. Most people are aware of physical law. We don't all know all of them, I'm sure, but physical law runs the body. It runs the universe. It runs the planet. No matter what you study in nature, you start with studying law, don't you? The mathematician studies law. There are four laws that govern every breath we take. It's the physical law. These laws here are often called the eight laws of health. Moral law. The dictionary calls the Ten Commandments the great moral code of ethics. Our constitution was based on the Ten Commandments. There's the moral law. But what is the mental law? I did not know mental law. So from then on, everything I read, I read through mental law glasses. And I have come at seven mental laws. Every time I read, sometimes I read something and I think, I think that's another mental law. But I find when I break it down, it actually fits into the framework of these seven mental laws. So let's have a look at them. The first mental law is Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction, which is the law of cause and effect. The law of action and reaction, it could also be caused. It could also be called. Effect follows cause with unvarying degree all through the planet, all through nature, and absolutely all through the body. And what we're looking at specifically today is mental law. The Proverbs, Proverbs 26 verse 2 states, The curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no mental problem happens without a cause. There is always a cause. And sadly often, the effect is blamed as the cause. Never blame the effect as the cause. Let's have a look at a couple. One mental situation that's happening quite often today is panic attacks. Panic attack has a cause. I'll give you one story. It's about a lady. She was about 50. She woke up in the middle of the night, total panic, just woke out of her sleep. She was in total panic. All her skin felt like electricity, it felt like an on edge. Her heart was thumping. She didn't know what was going on. She woke up her husband and said, something's terribly wrong. You're going to have to take me to hospital quickly. I don't know what's wrong with me, but something terribly, terrible is happening. They jumped in the car. He's half asleep, driving very fast. The police pulled him over and booked him. They got to hospital. They ran in. It was a very busy night. The nurses quickly assessed this lady was having a panic attack and they said, just take a seat. You see, that night they had a man who was having a heart attack. They had another man who'd lost half his leg. They had another man who'd lost a night in an accident. Can you see the, the priority list happens? On a busy night, you can wait eight hours. That's the current waiting time now if it's not something that's a crisis in casualty. That's why four doctors get me to go to their town to give meetings because they know that if everyone knew how to prevent, <laughs> there wouldn't be so many people in casualty and everyone knew how to do the simple treatments. 
So they sat. And the nurses were about to get to them and, oh no, another crisis came in, a severe car accident. Someone was fighting for their life. So can you see how the panic attack just gets left? After several hours, the lady started to feel a bit silly. She was okay now. She looked at her husband and said, Let, let's just go home. They went home. The next day, she felt very embarrassed about what happened. She was annoyed at the hospital for not seeing her, but she certainly understood that life-threatening things had come in and she realised hers wasn't life-threatening, though I can tell you it, she said it felt like it. That's why she went. She started to Google. She googled on the internet panic attacks. She googled a little bit further and she found that a panic attack is not unusual in a woman going through menopause. And it is, un and it is not unusual when she has a hormonal imbalance. She googled a little bit further and she found these people that make a cream in Australia called the Anna's Wild Yam Cream which is a cream that can balance the hormones. She pushed a little bit further and she found she could send away for a DVD called The Dance of the Hormones, which explains why there is a hormonal imbalance and how to get it, get it back into balance. She started to learn that if you exercise, drink more water, eat nourishing food, if you stop all the stimulants, the coffees, the refined sugars, the alcohols, she ordered the cream, she decided to ease herself off a coffee, Caffeine Blues, a book that I was given in New York, I think a year ago now, fascinating book on the effect of caffeine. And at the end of the book, he's got a chapter called Coming Off the Bean. And he says, if you have five cups of coffee a day, each cup of coffee have half a teaspoon of coffee and half a teaspoon of something like Echo or Caro. And every day you have more Echo or Caro and less coffee in your cup of coffee and as he says it's easy to get off the coffee without the suffering. So she stopped the coffee, she stopped the stimulants, she started exercising. Within a month she was feeling great, she had more energy, she'd lost a bit of excess weight, she'd been taking the cream. About two months later she woke in the middle of the night, exactly the same thing. Total panic. Her skin was all on edge, it felt like electricity crawling, her heart was thumping. She felt terror. Very quickly, frontal lobe kicked in. Very quickly, she assessed, aha, this is the panic attack. I know that I'm going to get less of these because of all I'm doing. She said to herself, I'll just slip out of bed, I'll go out into the night air and I'll breathe deeply. I'll have a crystal of Celtic salt with its three magnesiums to relax the muscles and I'll drink the glass of water. Water will calm. She put the kettle on to make a chamomile tea. Chamomile is a mild tranquilizer, mild sedative. She went outside, she did some stretches in the cool night air. By the time the chamomile tea was ready to drink, about 10 minutes, she'd calmed down quite a bit. She had a chamomile tea. The herbs in the chamomile tea and their active components of sedatives did the rest of the relaxing. About 20 minutes this took and she was back into bed and she slept the night. With great excitement, when her husband woke, she told him. <laughs> she told him what had happened. He was very relieved. He wasn't very happy about the fine in the middle of the night. Exactly the same situation happened to that lady but two vastly different ways of handling it. And the outcomes were totally different. You see, when she woke the first time, her feelings were very much in control. She didn't have the knowledge of what it was. She didn't have the knowledge on how to handle it. Fear overtook. And fear compounds everything. Fear of what would it be? Was she dying? Was she having a heart attack? You see where fear can take you? Fear actually can take you up the garden path. Your feelings are like a wild horse. They need the bridle on them. And the bridle is the frontal lobe. And it's in the frontal lobe that faith is exercised. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not things not seen. That's the Bible def definition of faith. If you can see it, it's not faith. When she, the second time, woke up, her feelings 
started to rise her fear, but very quickly she pulled frontal lobe. She put the bridle on. The board of senses, the critiques, came into play. Remember the highest function of frontal lobe is foresight and that's what faith does. It sees things you can't see. And quickly she assessed, she said, ah, it's the panic attack. Ha, I know what to do now. She didn't allow the thumping of the heart and the panic she felt and the... She didn't go there, she went here and she conquered it. The mind and the nerves gain tone and strength through the exercise of the will. The power of the will in many cases will prove a potent soother of the nerves and that's what she did. She used the will to soothe her nerves and the look on her husband's face the next day was more reward. Oh, thank you, dear wife. <laughs> I'm glad you've conquered it. I'm glad you've conquered it. Let's say for a moment that that night that that lady went into hospital was a, not, a light night. There weren't many people there. Let's say she was seen in half an hour. And I have been told stories of this too. And the doctor said, ah, you're getting a panic attack. And he gave her a shot of some, a drug that would calm her down and gave her a little bottle of tablets to keep her calm. A month later, she has another panic attack. She knows what it is. She, she grabs the drugs. She decides she really should go and see a psychiatrist. She sees the psychiatrist and he said, aha, I found the cause of all your problems. You get panic attacks. Now when she got that first panic attack, it was such a scary thing. It had quite a profound effect on her. It made a strong pathway in her brain. And when the doctor said, you get panic attacks, what did he do to that pathway? He strengthened it. The more you think about it, the more you do it, the stronger that pathway gets. So it got to the point in this lady's life that every time a stressful situation would arise, where would her feelings go? It would go down the panic attack pathway. And every time it goes there, what's happening is getting stronger and stronger. And the doctor started another pathway. You'll be on panic attack medication for the rest of your life. And every time she took her pathway, that meant her medication. Every time she tried to go without the medication but got too bad and eventually taking it, what's happening to that pathway? Very strong. And then that lady came to Misty Mountain Health Retreat and she told me of what was happening with her. But this lady was only 30 and her panic attack had actually happened because of a crisis in her life. I said to her, I think you're panicking about your panic attack. She smiled. What did the smile say? I think you're right. You see, the first, the, the tragedy that she went through, the crisis she went through, had such a profound effect on her, she, it had made a very strong pathway. So every time even a little crisis would happen, her feelings would go down that pathway. And she would relive what she lived that night, even when she went through a little crisis. But she was in a situation where when she'd have a crisis, her feelings would, oh, here we go. <laughs> and I can't stop myself going down that pathway. So I said something to her. I said, I believe you will be able to conquer your panic attacks. What did I do when I said that? A pathway, yeah. I made another pathway. I said, I believe you will be able to overcome your panic attacks and get off your medication. Wow, did she like the sound of that? And when she went home, her mother said, what did the naturopath say? The naturopath believes I can overcome it. The naturopath believes I'll be able to get off my medication. What's happening every time you say it? Can you see that? But I knew that the hardest time would be the first little crisis that came. So I gave her a prescription, what to do when the lightning strikes. I don't like the word panic attacks, almost makes you panic, lightning strikes. She had to laugh. She said, I will not feel like laughing when I get a panic attack. I said, that's right. You see what you're doing? Acknowledge the feelings, they're important. I said, no, you won't feel like it, but you'll be able to do it. What did I start then? You'll be able to laugh, by the way. It's one of the best things you can do for your family and friends. You'll do it. You'll be able to do it. 
Don't you say it as a mother, us mothers, all the time. You can do it. Try it this way. I can't. I know it's hard, but why don't you try doing it like that way? Why don't you? If you say, it is not hard, you've lost them. So, yeah, I know it can be a little difficult, but if you tried it this way, I do it like this. I find that if I take it, the, 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 the bucket's too heavy. Well, let's break it up into two buckets. Do you know what a parent does when they say to the child, oh, let me do it? You know what they've just done? You're hopeless. And a parent would say, no, I, I didn't. I was trying to help. Well, you're not helping them. We had a girl come here, 15, to work as um, work experience. She couldn't do anything. She didn't even know how to chop an onion. And after the second day she got angry, I said, what's the matter? She said, I'm angry at my mother for not teaching me. And when her mother came, her mother said, I thought I was being a good mother, doing everything for it. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no, we've got to have self-sufficient kids. <laughs> yeah, they're dependent on you when they're eight months, ten months, twelve months. And you know they want it. I do it by myself. That's what my son James used today. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> we think, oh, but encourage it. Okay, so they go to town and the buttons are all done up on the wrong. That's all right. <laughs> no, one, no one minds when they're three. I said, laugh. You'll be able to do it. Just start like this. Ho, 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 ho. Pretend to be a kookaburra. <laughs> What's the old saying? Fake it till you make it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> when you fake it, you've made a pathway, even though you're faking it. <laughs> and then you'll start to do it. I said, and put the kettle on. Get a chamomile tea. Go outside. Do some star jumps. Can't do star jumps. Do some push-ups. Can't do push-ups. Everyone can do push-ups on the wall. Do push-ups on the wall. Some sort of physical activity. I haven't even got a balcony. Um, throw cold water on your face. Have a cold shower. Can you see how you can do a whole lot of physical things to mm, just tip the pathway? If you've got someone there to help you, hot foot bath. Ah, oh, calms. Hot foot bath will calm everyone. It's great, just calms down. She conquered her panic attack. How did she feel when she conquered her panic attack? Very good. <laughs> And when she conquered that first panic attack, that pathway became stronger. How long does it take before this pathway is getting very weak and this pathway is getting stronger? It takes 21 days. 21 days, let's put it in here because it's important. 21 days to form a new habit and that same 20 day, one days of forming the new habit breaks the old. That's good news, isn't it? So you know what happens then? It gets to the point there where this pathway is stronger than that pathway so that every time a stress, stressful situation happens then, the lady will just go down the new pathway. And what's the new pathway? Now, what's happening here? Okay, let's make some solutions. Let's do what we can to prevent this happening again. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, we'll just manage it. <laughs> and there are ways to manage it. Do you know what that girl did? She rewired her brain. And you can rewire your brain till the day you die. I've got a fascinating book in the library called The Brain That Changes Itself by, by Norman Doidge. Excellent book, full of stories of people who rewired their brain and some at the age of 95. We can be rewiring our brain till the day we die. The old saying says, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, actually you can. You can. <laughs> the only time you can't is if they don't want to learn new tricks. It's as simple as this. If you say you can, you will, because you start an I can pathway. And if you say you can't, you're right. You won't, because you've started an I can't pathway. That's the good news. Our brain can be rewired till the day we die. Depression is not a cause. Depression is an effect.
What's the medical definition of depression? It's a chemical, imba chemical imbalance in the brain. Okay. What causes the chemical imbalance in the brain? Because chemical imbalance doesn't just happen. It is caused. What's an imbalance? Too many highs, too many lows. Let's have a look at what causes highs. What causes a high? Sugar causes a high. Caffeine causes a high. Alcohol causes a high. Tobacco causes a high. Drugs cause a high. MSG causes a high. All of these highs are transitory highs. They're delusive highs. And they come with corresponding lows. And what's another name for a low? It's depression. Sugar causes a low. That's your sugar blues. And what's the other book called about caffeine? Caffeine blues. What's the blues? It's a low. What's a hangover if it's not a blue? <laughs> I grew up in a home where I never heard an argument. Mum and Dad never drank or smoked. I grew up in a community where that was not happening. I became a psychiatric nurse and I tell you, they're wild, those nurses. <laughs> started to go to parties and there was drinking and drugs and smoking and I thought wow this is so much fun we all crashed at someone's house the night in the morning whoa was it scary everyone was cranky everyone was swearing and snapping at each other and I thought "Ooh, I don't like this I'd never seen such a thing I tell you I got out of that house real quickly and all that day I had some sobering thinking to do the high was great, but oh, the low was nasty. <laughs> it was very nasty. I didn't like it at all. When the person's got to have that next cigarette, they're at the low. When the person's got to have that other shot of a drug, that's when they're at the low. MSG, the low is the damage. They all cause the lows. Of themselves and absolutely together, they can all cause depression. Depression is also caused by a lack, a lack of oxygen. Oxygen vitalizes, invigorates and electrifies the brain. How do you feel after the morning walk? No wonder, no wonder Neil Nedley puts very depressed people on seven hours of exercise a day because of what it does to the brain. It gets those old stagnant thoughts out and the fresh thoughts in with the fresh supply of blood. Lack of oxygen often can be caused by lack of exercise. When you're feeling down, put those joggers on. When you're feeling down, get outside, get some fresh air, start walking and get some sunshine. It's from sunshine that the pineal gland is stimulated to release more serotonin. Serotonin is your mood hormone. Lack of sleep can cause depression. The Russians knew that if they kept a man awake for 16 days, he would die. How does a person feel when they've been half awake for 16 days? When you get those hours of power that we discussed the other day, that also is a cause of a release of serotonin. You want to feel good? Go to bed early. You want to feel good? Sit in the sun. You want to feel good? Exercise. Lack of water. Our brain is a hydroelectric system. When the human body is dehydrated, negative thought patterns can be established because of lack of water. Lack of fat. Once the water's gone from the brain, the fat cells are 70%. Sorry, the brain cell is 70% fat. And that extra fat compared to other cells is found in this myelin sheath around here. The two fats that the brain loves is your omega-3, those double bonds which cause a lovely fluidity to that cell membrane around the cell, but also the omega-3 is ensuring proper electromagnetic field, that electric, electric spark from cell to cell. The other fat is coconut. I was reading a paper of some research that's been done using coconut oil in Alzheimer's. Because the body likes burning the saturated fat as fuel, it appears with Alzheimer's there's an, there's an inhibition or an inhibiting, I should say, of uptake of glucose in the brain cells. And when that's happening, coconut oil can get in and use, be used as fuel. 
lack of progesterone. Progesterone's nickname is happy hormone. So when a person is lacking progesterone, you could almost see they're lacking happiness. I've seen many women conquer their depression by balancing their hormones with the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, getting those progesterone levels up, implementing the lifestyle, and then being able to ease off their antidepressants. Lack of, lack of progesterone can cause depression. That is the number one cause of postnatal depression, is lack of progesterone. Also, lack of minerals. The two minerals that are used probably predominantly, one would say, in brain cell function is magnesium and calcium. Calcium is the mineral that causes contraction. Magnesium is the mineral that causes relaxation. And in the heart muscle, it's calcium and magnesium that work together for the beating of the heart. But this arm that the messages run down is run according to magnesium and calcium. Calcium contracts, magnesium relaxes. So when the messages are coming down the nerve cell, they're basically coming down like that. And it's magnesium and calcium that ensure the proper delivery of those messages. So deficiency in calcium and or a deficiency in calcium both can both interfere with proper brain function. That's one of the dangerous things about caffeine. It causes a depletion in the body of both magnesium and calcium. Lack of vitamins. And the vitamins that the brain uses probably more than any other vitamin is your vitamin B, your B vitamins. When you think of B vitamins, think of brain vitamins. Do you remember I showed you earlier in the week that the little energy cycle in the cell requires those B vitamins? Well, those little energy cycles are inside every brain cell. But more than that, the B vitamins are responsible from the, for the spark from cell to cell and the proper function of the way the nerve cell runs. But the B vitamin that is probably the most famous for brain function is vitamin B3, which is niacin. I've got about five books in my library, all by different doctors who are treating mental illness with nutrition. 1% of psychiatrists today are treating mental illness with nutrition. There aren't many, but they are there. And they use the niacin. Some of them use up to 6,000 milligrams. That's six grams of niacin. This is for bipolar schizophrenia, and they're having some fairly impressive results. In this society where refined grains are eaten so much, the B vitamins are taken away with the refining process. Lack of, also excess. Excess pain can cause depression. You talk to people who are in constant pain and it's very, very difficult to deal with. So it's, always, it's looking at why the pain is there and doing what can be done to relieve the pain. Excess food can cause depression. How can excess food cause depression? Excess food irritates the stomach. And when the stomach is irritated, the whole nervous system is irritated. How's your patience when your stomach's upset? It's not good, is it? <laughs> It's not good at all. Excess stimulation can cause depression. Excess stimulation can cause depression because the brain needs a rest. My daughter Jessica, who lives in Tassie, she went to visit a girlfriend's mother and she said to me there was a huge television in every room of the house and every one of them was on and every one of them was on a different station. She said, the noise. And the mother was in the kitchen and there was this huge television there in the dining room and the radio was on. And Now the brain needs times of peace. It needs times of rest. <laughs> Excess stimulation can cause depression because when all that stimulation is taken away after the brain's been overstimulated, there's almost like an empty hole. You just look at this scenario. Kids get up in the morning, put the television and watch the cartoons. Mother says, enough of that. They go to the game station and play the video games. Mother says, enough of that. They go to the computer and do a little bit there. Mother says, I want you to have some bit of time outside. 
and the children all go and sit on the step and they say, I'm bored. Because overstimulation, it robs the human being of that wonderful thing called creativity. When the brain is never at rest, there's no creative thing happening. My son-in-law Matthew was sitting with his two little girls, I think they're four and six now, in front of the fire watching the flames. And he said, watch the flames, girls, because this is where the mind creates wonderful things. Mm -hmm. And also when you're watching the waves of the sea, isn't it? But when the brain is overstimulated, never getting a break, when that all stops, then there's like an empty void. And it robs the body of... It robs the body of uh, its creativity. Poison. The brain can be poisoned. What, po what poisons the brain? Heavy metals poison the brain. Mercury poisons the brain and with it is your lead, your cadmium. Chemicals poison the brain. And a lot of this is happening today. There are some cases happening because of pure of poisoning. Drugs poison the brain. A friend of mine had a bypass operation and one of the side effects of the anaesthetic was depression. And he said it took me a year to conquer it after I'd had those, those drugs. In fact, many drugs have depression as the side effect. My father was put into hospital a few years ago. He had a bit of a high fever and it seems to me that this was, he was given this and then this caused this and then this caused this and he was given an antibiotic and he got kidney failure and he was, um, then he was put into a coma and then when he came out of it his throat was sore, his chest was sore so they gave him Ventolin and then the Ventolin caused heart arrhythmia so he was given Digoxin and then Digoxin's side effect was depression so then they came in with the antidepressants I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> my father who'd never had a drug in his life it just all built up on each other. I was very happy when I was there one day there was an older doctor, a woman in her late 60s. She looked at his chart, she looked at him, poor dad was zonked out, he was 80 she said he's on too much medication. Oh, I was very glad to hear that. So she took him off almost everything. Dad's 86 today, on no medication, back home, living by himself. <laughs> but I saw the poisoning happening. Something else can cause depression. By the way, MSG can also poison the brain. And alcohol certainly can poison the brain. Something else can poison the brain. Negative thoughts. Negative thoughts physically can damage the brain cells. Do you know what this means, ladies and gentlemen? You can have someone who's keeping the eight laws of health, well, let's say not quite the last one. They're not taking any of this into the body, they're doing everything right, but they can be negative. Everything that happens, it's, oh no. Do you remember that old movie done in the 60s called Pollyanna? <laughs> Everything was wonderful. Everything she touched was wonderful. <laughs> and I think she made friends with this old man who grumped at everything and he couldn't believe that everything he grumped about, she was able to find something wonderful about it. It's all the way we look at it. Negative thoughts can actually damage the brain. Dr. Carolyn Leaf in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, she says that when negative thoughts are cherished, how would a negative thought be cherished when a person continually goes there? She says that little thorns actually grow between the dendrites and those thorns can damage the tissues of the human body. Wow, that's because of negative thoughts. I went to a seminar by a Dr. Neil Nedley a couple of years ago and it was a very interesting seminar. He's a GP and he said that he decided, he had so many depressed patients, he decided to start helping them with lifestyle. And he thought if the lifestyle could even equal the management that medication does, he'd be happy. He said it far exceeded, wow. He said lifestyle far exceeded management of depression compared to medication, wow. And there's no side effects with lifestyle. He said in his seminar, he said, depression is not caused by genetics. Wow. 
He said genetics cannot cause depression. Very important to understand that. I met a young girl who was on her antidepressants because her father killed himself and she believed that she had his genes. And she was depressed because she believed that she had his genes. So isn't that good news? Genetics cannot cause depression. Genetics loads the gun. Lifestyle pulls the trigger. You can have a loaded gun, we all do, but you don't have to pull the trigger. He also stated something else. Lifestyle tragedy cannot cause depression. Wow, that's impressive. He said together they cannot cause depression. But he said on top of that, you put all of these. He calls them hits. Sugar, caffeine, mercury, alcohol, tobacco, drugs. Lack of all these. He calls them hits and whoosh, the scales are tipped and the depression comes. The good news is we have no say over genetics, we have no say over lifestyle tragedy, but we have total say over that. That's the good news. I'm very, very cautious when I have someone with me who's depressed because I never want them to think for a moment that I think it's their fault. I never do, no way. Many people are sick physically and mentally through ignorance and that's why Information, education is power. I don't know who wrote this one, but I think it's a good one. When the student is ready, the teacher appears, in whatever form. And if one is open and transparent at such moments, wonders will flow accordingly. Because remember, we're the doctor. Dr. Neil Nedley states that there are over a hundred causes of depression. I haven't given you a hundred, but I've given you quite a few. Before we move on from cause and effect, there's one more that I'd like to look at. It's a verse in the Bible, and we know it very well because it's often quoted. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Nice saying. No, it's more than a nice saying. It's divine law, and that law states that whatever you give out, you shall receive again. Now that can be great and it can be scary. When's it's a bit scary? When what you're giving out is not good because it will come back. It's just the basic law of cause and effect. There's a verse in the Bible, it's Galatians 6 verse 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. I don't know if you've seen the slogan that's on the back of some cars now. It says, parents, be nice to your children. They're going to choose your old folks home. It's a law of cause and effect, isn't it? How many people are dumped because of the way they treated their children when they were little? But if they are dumped, the person that dumps them wants to be careful because their kids are watching what to do with them. <laughs> yeah. Even if you've been part of a bad cycle, you can break that cycle. When my, when my father was sick in Royal North Shore Hospital six years ago, my brothers and sisters and I, some of them travelled from all over the world and we're all there, five of us. And the nurses said they've never seen anyone receive so many visitors. <laughs> Dad was reaping what he's sown, yeah? I had a ma fantastic childhood. I have an amazing father. And you know, they're not forgotten, hey? My daughter Emma, she heard of this show on television about, on the radio, about ladies visiting old people that don't have anyone to visit them and she's got a whole lot of kids. And she thought, oh, I'm going to find an old folks home. So Emma put the, all the children in the car and went looking. <laughs> and she went in and she said to the nurse, I want to visit the old people that have never had visitors. So they did and Emma put, and the twins are about one year old, she put one twin on that lap and one twin on that lap and... So even if these people, you know, are suffering from that, I tell you, make the difference. You can make a difference. What a buzz. Talk about a buzz. <laughs> Forget drugs. That gives the best buzz is doing that. Life serves back in the coin you pay, says the saying. What goes round comes round. Now this can be very, very helpful for people who've been used, abused, badly treated, gone through some terrible lifestyle tragedies. 
That law states that the person that did that to you, guess what? It's going to come back on them. But stop watching because that's not your job. <laughs> One lady said, I've been watching a long time and it hasn't come back. I said, stop watching. And if it comes back on them and you laugh, be careful because when you go through a tragedy, you might find someone laughing at you. Because life serves back in the coin you pay, because what goes round does come round, if you've been badly treated, walk away. The Bible says, I love this verse, it's a, God speaking, he says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And I'll put something else on the end of that, I'll say, he'll do, he'll do a much better job, so leave it. But often he doesn't have to have vengeance because the person brings it on themselves because of what they've done. How can you walk away? That brings me to the next law. It's the law of choice. The brain has the ability to discriminate and it discriminates in the frontal lobe where its reason, judgment and intellect and will reside. The, the brain has the ability to discriminate and every choice we made should be made according to reason, intellect and judgment. And forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is not dependent on feelings because if it was, I would like to suggest we would never forgive. I was working with a young girl one day, she's 14, she's angry, she's bitter. She'd been sexually abused by her father from six to nine years of age. No wonder she's angry, no wonder she's bitter, but what's that going to do for her life? So for two hours one day I sat with her and I talked to her about the power of forgiveness. One writer said, forgiveness sets the prisoner free, the prisoner's me. It's the best selfish decision you can make. Forgiveness cuts the chains that bind you to painful past. Forgiveness sets you free, gives you wings, gives you healing. One lady said, they don't deserve to be set free. I said, you can't set them free. You can only set you free. Only they can set them free. After two hours of talking like this, she finally said, all right, I forgive. No feeling there. How could there be? When she said, all right, I forgive, there was a tiny little pathway. She'd made a decision. She had made it. She had used her will and she'd made that decision. No feeling in it. How could there be? Surely the worst, tra worst case of betrayal is a father doing that to his little daughter. As soon as she said it, I jumped up, shook her hand and said, congratulations, you have just made a momentous decision that will affect you for the rest of your life. Slight smile. What did I do when I shook her hand? I strengthened the pathway. A few hours later, she came to me and she said, I'm feeling better about it. Remember, 14-year-olds, they tell it like it is, frontal lobe's only half developed. I said, you are experiencing the third law of the mind, that your words affect your feelings. She didn't feel like it. She didn't want to do it. But everything I said, her frontal lobe said, I've got to do this. And she did it. And when she did it, when she said, all right, I forgive, her feelings responded. That's the way it should be. You see, your feelings, remember... That's where the fear comes in. Whereas frontal lobe, that's where the faith comes in. Believing that things are going to get better. Fear, when it gets in, oh no, what if my head falls off? What if my foot falls off? There's this, this fear thing. What if I never see again? What if I never hear again? Can you see where fear can take you? Remember, it's like the wild horse needs the bridle. Whoa up, whoa up. Hey, settle down, settle down. The mind and the nerves gain tone and strength through the exercise of the will. The power of the will in many cases will prove a potent soother of the nerves. You can do it. You'll be right. A couple of days later, this young 14-year-old girl said to me, I don't feel like it today. I said, that's all right. 
No wonder you don't feel like it. You've just had a trigger. And what's the trigger? It says, this is happening to me because of... Mm. You see, forgiveness is like a strong line through your life. And your feelings go up and down, all over the place. Doesn't mean you haven't forgive when you don't feel like it. No way. One lady said, I thought when I felt like that, I had to go over it all again. Who wants to go over that again? It's like one young girl, she came to me. Her parents sent her to our health retreat. She was 18. She'd been violently raped at 16. She sat in front of me like this. What does that mean? I don't want to be here. I don't want you to talk to me, but I have to. First thing I said to her was, if you don't want to tell me what happened to you, you don't have to. We don't have to know that. Her arms relaxed. She said, I've told the story so many times now, it doesn't even bring a tear to my eye. She'd been so to so many psychiatrists, the parents were at their wits end. She's a very beautiful girl. But oh, she had the bitterness in her heart. I started to talk to her about the power of forgiveness. No one had ever done that before. I don't think anyone had dared. <laughs> she started to cry. We finished the session. I talked to her about what I've previously mentioned about what forgiveness can do for you. The session finished. She gave me a slight smile at the end. The next day she wanted to see me. This wasn't a counselling session booked in by her mother. She wanted to see me. She, had some, she was excited. I said, yeah. She said, I've decided to take your advice and I have forgiven my abuser. Wow. It felt like electricity was in that room. Wow. And I saw the change in her. She said, I now know my healing is not dependent on whether I, my abuser goes to jail. And you know it usually is dependent on a clever barrister, isn't it? After two years, he had not. She said, I now know my healing is not dependent on compensation and so far it had been denied. She said, I know now my healing is not dependent on the next psychiatrist. She'd had a string of them who wanted her to relate this horrible story yet again. I'm not into digging up graves. There's only smelly, rotten things in there. She said, I now know my healing is not dependent on whether my boyfriend could make me happy, poor guy. <laughs> wow. I saw that girl leave our health retreat a different girl. What had made the difference? A decision. You see, you can't change what's happened, but you can change the way you see it. You can change the way you look at it. Many people are prevented from forgiving because they say they don't deserve it. deserve it. I say, absolutely right, but it's got nothing to do with it. It's got nothing to do with it. They'll never know. So how could it have anything to do with them? I got a good ending to that story. Ten years later, I did some meetings up in Lismore and a lady came to me, about 60, very nicely dressed. She said, I don't know if you remember me. She said, my daughter came to your health retreat 10 years ago. I said, yes. She said, I just want to tell you that that changed her life, her experience down there. She is now happily married with little children and she's raising the little children, just what she learnt at your health retreat. Isn't that good news? And the 14-year-old who decided to, all right, I forgive, she is happily married. I know her well, has a great sex life. Hey, how many abused girls have great sex lives? She's happily married to a gorgeous guy, got a couple of little children. Do you know there is freedom? There can be relief, all through the power of forgiveness. Love is also a choice. When we fall in love, we fall in love with character. The movies are wrong. Did you know that? Did you know Hollywood's got it all wrong? I know they've got it wrong because how many young people love the way the movies love and how many marriages fall apart today in Australia? I think it's up to around the 70% mark. Hey, something's wrong. Love is a choice. You can choose to love and you can choose not to love. I'm so glad we've got that choice. If love is a choice, what do you love? You love the character. And the choice to love is made here, according to reason, judgment and intellect. I'll give you a story to illustrate. My husband Matthew 
chose me according to a list. He'd been single for three years and he decided he needed a wife. His daughter was getting a little bit wild. <laughs> the house was a bit out of control. He needed a mate, he needed a wife. And he thought, my first wife I chose emotionally and it didn't work. I'm going to choose my second wife intellectually, scientifically, according to a list. So he wrote a list. He wrote the name of every woman that was at all, even mildly, eligible. Michael and I had known each other for 10, 12 years. We were very good friends. And unbeknownst to me, my name went on the list because I was a single mother. His mate, Gary Martin, because he was at Living Valley Springs at the time, said, why don't you choose one of the young therapists, mate? Michael was 40 at the time. He said, all right, I'll put it into my equation. And he said, doesn't work. He had a list of pros and cons against every name. Anyway, this list went on for apparently about a year. And after a year, one name kept going to the top of the list, he says. And unbeknownst to me, apparently it was my name. But I had two negatives against my name. One was I was older than him. At the time I was 44 and he was 40. And the other negative was I had six children. Who's going to take on six children? But he said when he got to know the children, because we moved up to Living Valley Springs about a year earlier to work, he, he thought the kids are really good workers. So that went to the positive side. So when that went to the positive side, all he was left with was that I was older than him and he thought, what does it matter in your 40s? So I went, that, that went from the negative too. So he went to his daughter one day and he said, well, today's the day I will ask Mrs. Russ to marry me. All, all, the, all the things are ready, today's the day. She said, Dad, you have to ask her out. He said, no, there'll be nothing emotional about this decision. <laughs> anyway, she talked him into it. She talked him into it. And I get a phone call, oh, hello, um, Barbara, would you like to go out for tea tonight? And I said, yes. I was most puzzled. I very much liked Mr O'Neill, but uh, I was very puzzled because Mr O'Neill never did this. You know, you never got close to Mr O'Neill. So I was intrigued. So we went out and we talked about the weather, um, the children, the health centre. He was the business manager at Living Valley Springs and I was the supervisor in the health centre. So you see, this never happened. At the end of the night, he shook my hand. <laughs> Three days later, Michael came into my house in the afternoon and he said, I've been thinking about things and I think we should get married. <laughs> Just like that. Do you know, that morning he got up and he said to his daughter, the courtship's gone on long enough. <laughs> Today is the day I will ask. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, Michaela, who was all of 11 at the time, she went and told all my kids. And my kids were all giggling around me all day. And I said, what's the matter with you kids? And they kept saying, Mom, you'll find out. Be patient. I didn't know what was going on. So when Mr O'Neill came in and said, oh, I think we should get married, I said, this is very analytical. He said, yes, I'm a very analytical person. I said, well, I think when two people marry, they should love each other. And he went, hmm. <laughs> Had to think about that one. And he said, well, I'm very attracted to you and I love your character. And I thought, wow, Mr O'Neill thinks that about me. I feel the same. I'd always very much liked Michael O'Neill. He just couldn't get near him with a 10-foot pole. In fact, it was all my dreams come true. So I said, yes, I will. <laughs> It seems like a flippant answer to a life's changing question, but when you realise we'd known each other as, a, as acquaintances, acquaintance, acquaintance, something like that, acquaintances, <laughs> for 10 years, and we'd been quite good friends for three years. So I said, yes, I will. He said, great, meet me tonight at my house with all the kids. And when he left, my two daughters... Emma was 21, Jessica was about 17. They came running in and went, well, unbeknownst to me, everyone on the whole property knew this. I said, yes, and they started jumping up and down with joy. Anyway, so we met Michael t that night at his house. The age of the children were, William was 10, Michaela was 11, 
Peter was 12, Mark was 13, Julia was 14, Jessica was 16, James was 19, Emma was 21. So they're the, six, they're the eight children. So they all sat in a half circle and he asked them all what they thought and they all agreed. I thought that was absolutely amazing. They all agreed. And I think he showed great respect to my children by not coming near me, not coming or touching me till the decision had been made. And he was a lot of fun and I know his kids loved all my cooking so it all, it all worked. <laughs> so that was great. In fact, that night by themselves, Peter and William separately came to him and said, oh, Mr O'Neill, um, can I call you dad? <laughs> and he's still dad. <laughs> so that was very nice. Now the next day, Michael walked past the window and my heart started beating fast and I thought, what's happening? And then I realised, oh, I'm marrying him. That's right, I'm marrying him. <laughs> But I realised that my words, what were my words? Yes, I will. I will marry you. Affected my feelings. You don't look at heart and say, okay, heart, love. The feelings happened. You see, we both admired, respected, and of course that's a very important part of love, but we neither had allowed the emotions to go there because the emotions aren't, weren't right. Now, because I'd said I will marry him without even checking my emotions, they just went there. <laughs> and that's how it works. That's the law of the mind, that your words affect your feelings. That's how it works. Michael said, no need to wait, let's get married. But you can't just get married. <laughs> anyway, he was going overseas for two weeks. So when he got back, we, we got married when he came back. And I must say, I've been in a very difficult marriage where I was married to a drug addict. And that was one of the worst. The early days were good and I say to my children, you were loved and conceived in love. But I must say that a marriage based on reason, intellect and judgment, choosing to love because all the qualities are there, the emotions follow. Of course the movies say if it feels good you must love them, doesn't it? And I'll tell you how much sadness is on the planet because of that. When you fall in love with the feelings, with the looks, well, I've got some sad news, the grey hair comes. <laughs> but when you fall in love with character, the character gets more beautiful with age. So love is a choice. And I'm glad love is a choice because we have a choice to love or not to love. And sometimes we must not because it's unsafe, because they're married to someone else, because can you see that? And if you choose not to love, maybe your feelings have gone around someone that, that really is not, not available, then as time goes on, you know, because you choose not to, those feelings will go away. Your feelings are a bad boss because they go all over the place. The frontal lobe with the faith choice is the good boss. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. The Proverbs, Proverbs 12, 18 states, There is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. I think we've all felt the piercings of a sword, but do you know who it's the piercings of a sword to the most? The speaker. If someone goes off their brain at me, I can think, they've got a bit of a problem, <laughs> and I can walk away from it. But I tell you, the person that speaks like that, they have to live with themselves. And sometimes the hardest person for someone to forgive is themselves. Hmm? You might know the story where Peter came to Jesus and said, how many times do we forgive? Seven times? He said, 70 times seven. That's 490. In other words, you never stop. And the person to forgive is yourself. If God forgives you, and he freely does, then who are, who are we not to? There's a beautiful verse in the Bible. It's, I think it's Acts 17 verse 30. It says, God winks at our ignorance. So we should wink at our own ignorance. Okay. <laughs> your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on that. It's as simple as this. If you say you can, you will, and if you say you can't, you won't. How powerful are those words? How powerful are those words? There are some words that should have never been said. And there are some words that should have been said that were not said. And that brings us to the fourth law of the mind, that your words reveal your feelings. And some words cannot come out. 
Some say it's your right to speak your mind. It's your obligation not to because you don't know the effect of your words. You don't know what that person went through that day. There's another proverb. I think it's Proverb 18.13. It says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and it is shame to him. Find out the whole story before you start commenting. Proverbs 29.11 states, The fool utters all his mind, but the wise man keeps it until afterwards to check out all the pieces. I raised six and then eight children. Do you know what you see and what you come to the conclusion of is often wrong? Have you noticed? <laughs> Always find out before you speak. There's another proverb, I think it's in Proverbs 17:27. Um, it says, Even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. But you're frustrated. Well, go for a run. Go and dig a garden. Go and chop some wood. Have a cold shower. Don't speak until feelings are back under control. <laughs> Try only to speak when the frontal lobe is in control. Remember, that's your board of senses. They're your critiques. How often does our frontal lobe do it? Oh, don't, don't say that. <laughs> well, don't say it. But I want to speak my mind. We'll go for a run and have a good think about it because you can never take those words back. Never can they be taken back. One lady told me she went to a counselling session with her husband and they'd been fighting a lot. And she said to him, but you said that I'm an idiot. He said, oh, I didn't mean it. Hmm? Those words went in and they have their mark. We should not say anything we don't mean. That's no excuse, is it? Oh, but I didn't mean it. Oh, but it was a mistake. Well, it should not have come out. That's why it's so important to keep these things out of the body. It's so important to keep frontal lobe sparky so you have the ability not to say it. How many words would have been better left unsaid. I rarely said what I felt like saying as a mother because frontal lobe would shoot forward and I would think, yeah, and how are they going to feel if you say that? Better to sing, la, sing some opera, <laughs> whistle, <laughs> far better. In how many homes is the mother screaming at the child because they've spilt the milk and I told you to be careful, blah, blah, blah. then the phone rings, oh, hello. You know what the child thinks? My mother likes that person better than me. It, so easy to control those words when these are out of the system. So easy when you've gone to bed early. So easy when you're eating nourishing food. You've got an edge. I remember one, one day my son Peter, he asked me to tell him what this word was in his schoolwork. He was about nine at this stage. Peter was dyslexic. At this stage, I didn't know that. It just took so long to teach him anything. I'm glad he was my fifth child. With the first four, I thought I knew it all. But then Peter arrived <laughs> and he didn't get anything. It took me two years to teach him what it taught the others. But Peter could fix things. He could fix anything. And he was always so helpful. He's one of those kids, you say, Peter, yeah, mum, yeah, yeah, what do you want, mum? Yeah, just do anything. So he was very popular amongst all the kids because he was so helpful. But oh, he just couldn't get to school. Anyway, at nine, he knew all his letters. He knew his basic reading. And this morning he said, mum, what's this word? Now I'm over with James, helping him with some long division. James is about five years older than Peter. I said, hang on, James, I'll just see what Pete wants. And when I looked at the word, I just saw red. It was the. I've told him the thousands of times. The. Now, my feelings started to rise. I'm thinking, what is the matter with this kid? When is he going to get it? I didn't have to. That's what I wanted to say. That's what I felt like saying. I felt like saying, Peter, when are you going to get it? I didn't have to tell the other kids this many times. It's the, this stupid little word. I've told it to you thousands of times. But early that morning, I'd prayed for each of my children. Early that morning, I'd say, Father in heaven, give me wisdom for each of my children today. Early that morning, I'd ask God for help. You see, God communicates with mankind through the frontal lobe. None of this was in my body. I had two edges. 
Number one, I'd ask God for wisdom and he will never fail you. Number two, none of this was in my body, so my frontal lobe was working well. So the messages were coming. I'm tempted to say it and this voice is saying to me, oh yeah, and how's he going to feel if you say that? You know he's a different kid. You know he fixes everything. You know he's very diligent. You know he's the... Can you see this dialogue? We know the dialogue, don't we? But I've told it. Yeah, yeah, you have. You know he's a bit different. When he was four, he said to me, Mum, how come what we see is so big and our eyes are so little? Now that told me there's something different in that brain. And so my conscience through the voice of God is saying, you know, this car's a bit different. Ease off, ease off. And how's he going to feel? You see that dialogue? took a deep breath because you know the voice we listen to wins the fight. took a deep breath. The Peter. Oh, as if I've never told him <laughs> the before. Back diligently at work. How do I feel when I'm walking away from that? I feel like a mighty conqueror. Hmm? A mighty conqueror. Isn't that where the battles lie? They're right there. There's a proverb I taught my children. It's Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Let's say I'd said what I felt like, saying, Peter, when are you going to get it? How many times do I have to tell? How would Peter feel? And what are all those statements? You're an idiot, Peter. You're stupid, Peter. They're all put-downs, aren't they? Peter would have started crying. Jessica's across, she would have started crying. Do I feel like helping James with his long division now? I want to ring someone's neck. Next time Peter needs help, is he going to call me? Can you see that? They're only little words, but life is made up of the little tiny things. And they need more attention because they get bigger. Number five, adaptation. By the way, before I just move on to this, I never ever suggest that you should hold it in till you explode. I'm not suggesting that at all. That's why I say go for a run, go for a walk, go for a jog, do some star jumps, do some push-ups, have a cold shower and get those feelings under control because there are words that need to be said. And if frontal lobe is in control, you can do what the Bible says to do. Let your speech be always with grace always with grace, seasoned with salt. <laughs> what does salt do to food? Makes it taste nice. <laughs> Sometimes you'll write a letter. Sometimes the letter will just be posted into that fire there. <laughs> Sometimes it will be sent. Yes, you must deal with your feelings. There are ways. Because of the law of adaptation, the brain has the ability to change. Only the last 10 years has scientists have acknowledged that we have a changeable brain. That is good news and bad news. It can change for the worst or it can change for the better. And that's where the choice factor comes in. Because of the law of adaptation, be careful what you're reading, be careful what you're saying, be careful who you're with, be careful what you're watching, be careful what you're listening to because all has an effect on your brain. There's two proverbs that explain the changeable brain. One is Proverbs 13 verse 20. It says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed because of the law of adaptation. The other proverb is Proverbs 22 verse 24 where it says, Make no friendship with an angry man. With a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare for thy soul because of the law of adaptation. So if you want to be wise, who do you walk with? The wise. <laughs> but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Because of the law of adaptation, the brain has the ability to grow and the brain has the ability to shrink. So I'm going to give you a terrible growing scenario and a wonderful growing scenario. Then I'm going to give you a terrible shrinking scenario and a wonderful shrinking scenario. Have you heard of the fish that got away? Every time the story tells is told, what happens to the fish? <laughs> it gets bigger. Do you know that? What, that's what happens when we've gone through something that really has torn our heart out? Every time we relate the story, it actually can appear bigger and bigger and bigger. I was reading about a 
tragic situation that happened. It didn't say what it was, but four people were involved. Then the four people went their own way. 20 years later, each person was interviewed and asked to relate what happened on that fateful day. If you were to read the four accounts, it was as if there were four totally different situations. There almost wasn't a link between them because each mind magnified different things, shrunk different things because of the way we see it. We see through our own eyes. The Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. <laughs> and that is so true. How do you see it? When we continually relate, either verbally to other people or in our mind, tragedies we've been through, they can get bigger and bigger. And because they're harmful and hurtful, that's where the thorns begin to grow with those negative feelings. Let me give you a wonderful growing scenario. A.A. A. Milne, the poet, said, The world is full of so many things, we all should be as happy as kings. We should be learning new skills constantly. After an old 70, well, a 75-year-old man heard this lecture and he said to me, I'm a violinist. I've just put, put my most difficult pieces away. He said, I'm going home to get them out again. Absolutely. One piano teacher said to me, my oldest patient, my oldest student is 78. And scientists show that musical instrument, learning a musical instrument, no matter what the age, is more responsible at growing new dendrites than any other activity. Can you play a musical instrument? If you can't, it's time to learn. Triangles out. What about a mouth organ? What about a recorder? Just start small, but learning to play a musical instrument is the most powerful activity for developing brain growth. How does the brain grow? Every time you learn something new, you develop another dendrite. Another dendrite. You know the scales that they do on the piano every day? Another dendrite, another dendrite, another dendrite, another dendrite. Every time you learn something new, you develop another dendrite, another dendrite. So every day we should learn something new. Every day we should develop more skills. Can you knit? Can you sew? Can you crochet? Can you build with wood? Can you build with metal? I'm not interested in building with wood and metal, but I love knitting and I love difficult pieces. I knitted a dress out of fine baby wool for my granddaughter, 259 stitches on a row. I love it. And then after I've done the pattern three times, I've memorized it. What do you think's that done for my brain growth? New dendrites, every time you learn something new. I was with my daughter last week and she's learning to roller skate. I said I'd watch. <laughs> if I lived there, I'd learn it. I'd love to do it, but we can't really roller skate out here. She's learning a new skill. Can you do Scottish dancing? Can you do ballet? Can you do belly dancing? Can you ski? Can you skate? Can you ride a bike? Can you water ski? We should learn new skills all the time. We should never stop learning. We should see more grey-haired people on the skateboard track, eh? Tell you what, those kids need us, yeah? <laughs> they can show us a thing or two. Tell you, have you been there? They're clever, <laughs> very clever. And that, that's not genetics, is it? It's not money, it's just learning new skills. We should never stop learning new skills. In 1998, a group of scientists discovered that in the hippocampus part of the brain, neuronal stem cells are made. What are neuronal stem cells? Neuronal is nerve cells. Stem cells are constantly being remade, new cells, in the hippocampus part of the brain. And they discovered pathways out of the hippocampus, meaning that those new cells can be sent to areas where there's been death to, to replace the dead cells. How's that? And there's one activity that stimulates the hippocampus to make those neuronal stem cells, and it's half an hour walking a day. That's an easy one, isn't it? Half an hour walking a day stimulates the hippocampus to make more or new nerve cells. That's good news. 
Let me give you a terrible shrinking scenario. If you don't use your brain cells, they die. You've heard the saying, if you don't use it, you will lose it. We apply that to the muscles, and it's absolutely true on the muscles, but it's more applicable to the brain cells. So you've got no choice in the matter. You can't stop using your brain because you will lose your brain. We should ever be learning. Never should the time come. I love the story of the 92-year-old man who just graduated from law school. Did you hear that? just graduated from law school. Many people say, my brain can't do it anymore. Well, it can't do it because you've just said you can't do it. Do you hear that? And you also can't do it because too much sugar, too much caffeine, too much alcohol. Can you see all of that? There's a formula. And if you abide by the formula, it works. So that's the fantastic shrinking, sorry, that, that's the terrible shrinking scenario. And when you are constantly watching negative television, negative violence, hearing negative negativity, that can also cause a shrinking of the brain cells. But I've got a wonderful shrinking scenario. When you forgive everyone or anyone who has ever hurt you, who has ever misunderstood you, you turn painful past to dust. And when you turn painful past to dust, there's no bad smell to draw you down there anymore. <laughs> it's just dust. It's inert. When you forgive everyone who's ever hurt you, you turn the painful past to dust and the pathway to those memories actually shrinks. So you rarely go there anymore. Isn't that good news? That's excellent news. When you forgive everyone who has ever hurt you in your life, that night when you go to bed, something is stimulated. They're glial cells. Glial cells are the brain's vacuum cleaners. And glial cells are numerous. There's more glial cells than nerve cells. And those glial cells, they come along and they vacuum clean up the thorns. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain?, she describes this phenomenon. Isn't that amazing? So forgiveness actually has a physiological effect in the brain to clean it up. And I've seen numerous people go through tragedy in their life and relate the story often. And when they take the step, the very brave step, the decision to forgive, they stop relating the problem. It's actually a side effect of forgiveness is the problem's not related. And when it's not related, it's not getting big anymore. <laughs> it's actually starting to shrink. It's a very powerful thing. There are two polar opposites in our brain. One is fear and one is faith, and they are totally opposite. And it's from fear. Let's say this is the fear one. It's from fear come all the negative things, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all break down the life forces and have the ability to invite decay and death in the body. That's the fear side. But there's a beautiful verse in the Bible. It's 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. God says, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In other words, a sound mind has no fear. <laughs> On the other hand, we've got faith. And in Hebrews 11 verse 1, the Bible says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And from faith comes all the good things, love, joy, peace, tenderness, mercy. And my daughter gave me this one on hope. You see, hope and faith are inseparable companions. Hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible and achieves the impossible. How's that one? And you know how faith grows strong? Faith grows strong by earnest conflict with fear and doubt. Wow. So the doubts get thrown in, but how do you get your faith strong? Earnest warfare <laughs> with fear and doubt. Wow. That's how faith grows strong. The strongest trees are the ones on the mountainside where the wind rushes. The delicate trees that break easily are in the forest that have no heart, that have no challenging situations at all. 
The Bible gives a beautiful illustration of our faith. It says it's like gold, tried in the fire, that you may be rich. And you know what the fire does to gold? Burns off all the rubbish. Do you know what our trials do? It's to burn off all the rubbish so that our gold of faith shines the brighter. Beautiful analogy. The last law is the law of diversion. The law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. Use it. We use it on the children, don't we? They want to push every button on the television. Look at the bird. <laughs> you divert them away. Use it on yourself because it is a law of the mind that when something is denied so as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. What's the old saying? When God closes a door, he opens a window. My 13-year-old son James said to me, Mum, sometimes the window is bigger than the door. How nice to be able to see that. You know what an Italian man said to me? He said, oh, no, 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 no. In Italy we say when God closes a door, he opens two. <laughs> have you noticed? Many people have got their arm and their foot trying to stop that door closing and they can't see the sun shining out of the other two doors. When something is firmly denied, accept it and have a look at where you can go now. Let the rocks of trials in your life not crush you, but be stepping stone to greater things. It's not what happens to us, or what we do with what happens to us. So I thank God every day for the gift of choice. Your brain is an amazing brain, and it has been given to you as a gift to use for your enjoyment to use for memory. And yet how many times is a person's brain actually destroying them? Usually through ignorance on the tools that you are at our hands so that our brain can actually get brighter, stronger and smarter with age. Let me finish on the opening line to my book. My romantic daughter Jessica found this one. It was written by Robert Boyle in 1690. It is highly dishonourable for a reasonable soul living in so divinely a built mansion as the body she resides in to be totally unacquainted with its exquisite structure. It is our aim at Misty Mountain to help you become acquainted with your divinely built mansion and its exquisite structure.